Now, I hope you read all the scripture that what you got to copy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That is very important in a part of my lesson, so I'm not going to refer to them specifically very much, but I also want to add two. I want to add 1 John 5 and 7, that if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and his blood cleanses us from all sin. And then also 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And those are very important and I thought and found them after I'd already done my lesson. <laughs> But first, I want to talk about you, each one of you, and I hope that you will consider that, that I'm speaking to each individual one of you. And this kind of goes against Dale's sermon last Sunday when he said, we're humble and we don't amount to much. But I'm telling you, we do amount to much. Because this is what from Joe Barnett. And he says, hello, wonderful you. In him, we live and move and have our being. Unique you. How wonderful. How unique. Well, there's no one else in the world like you. Never has been. They're not now and never will be. At the time of this writing, and that was in August, U.S. population is 335,705,757, not a single one like you. But there's more. <clears throat> World population is seven, I'm not good with numbers, <laughs> seven billion, 970 million, not one of them like you. In all history, 117 billion people have lived on the earth. 117 billion, not one like you. Each one of us is unique. That's the way God planned it and executed it. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's Psalm 139, 13 through 16. Hello, wonderful, unique you. You are one of a kind. And also he's written something, I'm not going to read it all, but he's written something about friendship. And that's what we are. We're sisters in Christ. But we're also friends, even though we don't see each other that much or don't know each other very well. We're, it says no birth certificate is issued when friendship is born. But at that moment, life takes on a new meaning. Pleasure is expanded. Pain is diminished. And life is enriched. True friendship is a pure and satisfying relationship because it isn't contaminated by competing for power, position, or profit. American philosopher and author Hilbert Hubbard said, a friend is someone who knows all about you and loves you anyway. <laughs> so we need someone in life. So we can be humble in our service but we also, each one of us is important and is important to our friends. Okay, I'm going to read my story because it's a long one. And if I exceed the time allotted to me, somebody just rang a bell. <laughs> <laughs> As I understand, my part of the lesson, the series of horror in this quarter, will be about my life in my life as a Christian, like the previous ones you've heard by others before me. 
But first, I wanted to say a few words about you, and I read that to you. And uh, um, this is where God says, "He, your hands made and fashioned me. Psalm 119, verse 73. Now, I was told I was born June 25th, in 1929, in a small one-bedroom, one-bath company house. And it was out in the oil fields between Crane and McCabe, Texas, in Upton County, between uh, below Upton County, in, near Ector County, and that's where Odessa is located. My dad worked for an oil company called Gulf Oil as a production engineer. He was a gang pusher. Now, not like the gangs we know today. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, um, he was head of the several men that did work. What they did was uh, um, put pipes together to transport the oil and the gas. And my mother was a little bitty woman, four feet, 11 inches tall, and, I, and weighed about 100 pounds. She was medium small. And I was their first child. And in two more years, she had two more. In three years and one month, she birthed three children. I had a sister who was 19 months younger than me and a brother born 15 months after that. Then a surprise came along to them. When I was 17, she birthed another boy. <laughs> surprise. But back then, she was told after when I was getting ready to be born, she was told by the company doctor. Now, the Gulf Oil had company uh, doctors that they hired to take care of the men. But this doctor told her after my mother had been in labor about eight or ten hours, he said, "She, this child cannot be born. Oh. We're just going to have to take her out piece by piece. Take it out piece by piece. Oh. And they did do cesarean back in those days, back in the oil fields. But my mother had a different <clears throat> idea. And she was insistent that they call in another doctor, one she knew of in McCabe, Texas. So my dad sent for him, and he successfully brought me to life. And then similarly, Anita, um, we had trouble getting Anita here. I'd had a long labor, and the doctor told me he just about given up on me. But there was an experienced older woman, a nurse, and she said, she came in after I'd been in labor a long time. She said, we're going to have this baby. <laughs> and, then, and so she did work with me. And behold, Anita, Anita Lorraine Mansell Price came into being. <laughs> and also, Anita had trouble with her first child, Angie. But God was in charge all the time. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My life as a Christian began when I was about 11 years of age. I had gone to churches when I was really young. My dad was not a Christian at first, and he greatly influenced my mother, and she wouldn't attend either. I think she was baptized and attended the first Christian church when young. But we lived with my grandmother for a while, who was first Christian as well, and there were several churches, buildings nearby the Methodist and the Assembly of God. So my sister and I would walk to church because we lived in that little big town of Crane. And we would take my little brother with us. And then he would really, when we go to the Assembly of God, he'd really get the spirit. And he'd say, we just need you to testify. And we're still standing there with my sister and I. And we'd try to control it, but we couldn't. But then when I was eight or 10 years old, my dad was converted, and he and my mom were attending the Church of Christ. And of course, we kids did too. And we began to attend every service. And for years, I've done that. Continued until I can't drive anymore. I don't like to ask Anita to come out and take me. And I can't sit very long anymore either in one spot. So that's my life story, but I want to talk a little bit about my prison ministry. First, though, I need to tell you how I came to live in Gatesville, Texas. I've not told you yet that just out of high school, 
I was married to Anita's father, her dad, Barry H. Fancel. We lived in Crane, and he moved there from Oklahoma when he was a senior in high school. And he didn't really want to leave Oklahoma because he was an athlete. He lived, went to a small school and got to play basketball all the time. But he was, um, his mother, um, a widow at that time, he was the, he was the last of 13 children, um, and she raised nine of them. But anyway, he was six years older than me. He had been in the Air Force at the end of World War II. When, his discharge, when he was discharged, his mother, a widow, moved there to Crane because she had two daughters who lived there. And they moved her into a small uh, one-bedroom, one-bath house. And of course, my husband came home from the service, he lived with her. And then he entered Sol Roth College in Alpine, Texas. And he was a very talented basketball player. And a year later, he earned a scholarship and was a veteran so he could go to college free back in those days. That was what he was doing when, when we met. After he finished college and we, and we returned to Crane, he began job hunting, job hunting. And we were there in college uh, four years in all. And Anita, of course, was born right before we started. He started college. So um, after he was, after she was born, she and I went to Alpine and joined him. Um, and he was, um, when he was getting ready to go to college, after he'd been there a year, he, we were started dating, and I fell for him like a ton of bricks. You know, <laughs> a good looking young man, a little older than me, and was a, um, a veteran and pretty experienced. In fact, I think he dated all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was, um, he was very talented. The sad thing, and he was very, he played basketball a lot. And the sad thing is that uh, after he was converted about seven years later, we were in the church in Odessa, Texas. And um, they were, uh, we had get together fellowships on Friday night. And we were at the gym and they were playing basketball. And he dropped dead on the basketball. Uh, playing basketball. He was only 46 years old. Um, but I'll uh, go back to college. After he finished college, we returned to Crane and he began job hunting. He was unable to get hired as a geologist. That was his major. So he joined an old time high school and college friend, Winston Holcomb, as <clears throat> going to work for rotary engineers and they would go to different oil well sites taking rock samples. That was back a long time ago. And he was married to a woman, Betty Hinesley, and again, we women and our daughter Anita joined them, traveling to at least three different states for three years. We lived three, three months in one, a month in one state. Uh, we just traveled everywhere. And during that time, our first son, Stephen Lee Maxwell, was born. But we had bought and lived in a house trailer. And it was small, and Anita's first bed was a sofa. And she lived, and she worked, she slept on that sofa till she was six years old. And we moved to Midland so she could start the school. Uh, Mary had been converted to Christ in the church seven years earlier. And of course, I was totally devastated and spent the next several years grieving. I was only 40. We had birthed another boy, Dale, along with Stephen. And Steve, and Steve had married, I mean, I, he and Steve were three years apart. But Steve had married his high school sweetheart. But both boys were young when their daddy died only 17 years of age at that time. Anita had married Daryl 
in, in the past, and after they finished college, college at LCC, they moved to Arkansas and attended Harding College, where they both obtained degrees. But um, <clears throat> I, 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 I have these pages outlined, but I can't remember for sure. But I need to tell you that um, I spent about seven years as being a widow after he passed away. And so um, I, I came in, I worked at Lubbock Christian University. I also attended there as a student back in 1972. And then I got a, a job with them and worked there a little while. But then I had a, a friend back in when we lived in Midland, Texas, we were close friends with three other couples, the Knights and the Bodines and the Horns. One, one couple was Selwyn Horn, my second husband, and Sadie, his wife. And I'll tell you a little bit about them in a minute. Anyway, um, when I, I, I decided that after I was a widow seven years that I needed to get back to my life. And so uh, this friend of mine, these friends in Abilene, and uh, her name was Janine and her husband, Ed, they, um, she worked for Abilene Christian. And so after I was a widow about six years, she said, Helen, uh, why don't you come and live in Abilene and you'll be equidistant between Anita and Daryl and then your parents because back in 1965, her dad and I had bought a ranch in central Texas near, near Gatesville. <coughs> and Gatesville is a little town close to not too far from Waco. And so we had bought a ranch there, a friend in the church. His uncle was selling a ranch and it was almost a miracle. At that time, he was offering it pretty cheap. And so at that time, my husband, her dad, Anita's dad was working as a, um, a brine well, a salt water, producing business. In fact, he and another guy owned it. And so he was making pretty good money. And so we thought, well, we'll just buy this. Because he had, her dad had always wanted to live back in the country. And he was a farmer by trade. He had been a farmer. And so he wanted to move back to, wanted to move out in the country. And this friend in the church in Odessa said, my uncle is selling his place. And it's 600 acres, and it um, it's in Central Texas, and it's near a creek, and has some ponds on it. As I say, and of course, my husband had grown up with animals too, and he wanted to raise animals, cows, and, and horses. And so um, we we bought it, we paid down on it, and so then we had that place. But it didn't have, it, it had an old house, 100 years old at that time even, but no one had lived in it in a long time, and it was kind of called it apart. But um, we went ahead and bought it, and my mother and daddy patched it up a little bit, and my dad had retired from this oil company, so they moved on the ranch and lived there and took care of it for us. And so then I was working, I could, was working love it, but then I needed to, to travel there a lot to see them and check on the ranch. And so Janine, this friend in Abilene who worked for Abilene Christian said, Helen moved to Abilene, I'll get you a job there. Then you'll be equidistant between Anita and Daryl and also the ranch and your parents. So that's what I did. And so, uh, anyway, um, 
my son, uh, after my mother and daddy lived on the ranch for 10 years and took care of it for me, my son had graduated from college from Abilene Christian, and he had, he, he had been married, he was married, and he and his wife went to the ranch, and after my mother and daddy uh, moved back to town, a little town in, of, the, of Gatesville, he bought the ranch, I mean, my son and his wife moved there, and he still lives there. He's never lived anywhere else. He's wandered around a lot, but he's still, <laughs> he still resides there now. I'll, work, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He, I'm very proud of him now. He um, worked at, in social work for uh, social, the Social Agency of Texas for years. But um, he worked there. In fact, he worked 50 years in all. And he just recently retired, fully retired. But he still lives on the ranch. Of course, he, uh, later on, he remarried, and this woman, her dad, tried to improve that place, and they did a lot to the house, and a lot to the barns, and even built different barns, so it's a good place to live. So, um, like, like I said about Sadie, uh, the horns, Sadie Horn was married to my First, my second husband, and she was one of my good friends, and we all attended the same church, Fort Worth and Jack Street Church of Christ in Midland. <clears throat> so, and while I was working at LCC, my good friend Janine was living with Abilene and working at Abilene Christian. And so she said she could find a job for me there, and I could move there. And even though I had a good job in Lubbock and Lubbock Christian and was happy here, that was back in 1972, I decided, I decided I would be closer to my parents and I could visit them at the ranch. So I did. I moved to Abilene. I had already sold my house in Odessa. And I had bought one in Abilene. And I was in the process of getting a yard started and was getting settled, thinking I would just finish my degree. I had started school here at Lubbock. And I'll finish my degree and I'll get a good job. And I'll just live the rest of my life, my single life, in peace and in being productive. And then Dale, my son, could live with me and attend Abilene Christian. So uh, anyway, um, that's what I thought I would do. But my life changed a lot. And that and it just goes to show you how God might have different plans for you than what you think you want to do. So enter Sylvan Horn. And he and his wife, Sadie, and their three children had moved from Midland. And they, I told you that we had lived on the same block with them and this other two families that we were all really close to. In fact, they had bought a cabin on Possum Kingdom Lake near Graham, Texas. And the three families had bought this cabin and they visited there a lot. And then of course they would invite me to come too. And so he and his wife, Sadie, and their three children, they moved to Midland, from Midland to Henrietta, Oklahoma. And he was, he'd been working in a bank in Midland, and he, but he was uh, selected and offered the presidency of a bank, a small bank, in Henrietta, Oklahoma. And then he went ahead and accepted it, and he and his family moved there. After several years of their living there, his wife, Sadie, developed breast cancer. And she lived only two more years. She tried, she had surgery, trying to recover, but she sadly she lost her sight. Now I had been keeping up with them and had visited them after my husband died. 
and visited them and met with them in the Knights and the Monads of Abilene, who had all remained close friends through the years. But you know what now? I'm the only one left out of all of them. <laughs> Three families. I'm the only one left. When Sadie died, their third child, a daughter, was only 14. <clears throat> and so his he had a son who was single, and he's still single and lives. I'll tell you more about him later. He's my stepson. Anyway, um, the bank board there in Henrietta started setting up dates for Sylvan after his wife died about a year later. They started setting up <laughs> dates with him and other widows in town. <laughs> <laughs> and so Janine said, how long do we have to do something about Sylvan? <laughs> And I've been a widow for seven years, so Janine thought, you know, I just need to get them together. <laughs> because I had been dating several young men, several gentlemen, some here in Lubbock, and so uh, she thought, you've been single seven years, and I'll just get you and Sylvan together. So after about a year, and his grieving for Sadie, um, she... Um, she started inviting him to to uh, Abilene in into the, the uh, cabin that they owned, and so and then she always included me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, I knew him. I knew I had known his family, knew his children, and uh, so I just started. You know, we just started meeting together at times. And then he just, I don't know, something just kind of clicked, and so he started courting me. And so he would travel from Oklahoma, Henrietta, um, about every weekend to Abilene to see me. Because oh. I had bought a house and was living there. And then so as we had been four families living together, going to church together in Midland. But then now we were only three families. And so within a few months of his courtship, he asked me to quit my job and move with him and Gina, live with him in Henrietta. I thought, you know, that's what my first husband did. He asked me to quit my job. <laughs> I was working in a bookkeeper in Odessa, and he was going to college at Saul Ross, and he said, why don't you quit here and just move with me to Saul Ross College? And I, I mean, I never did get a proposal of <laughs> My sister had already married at 16 years old, so my dad couldn't tell me I couldn't get married. <laughs> but he, we did ask my dad, and my, that all that my dad ever asked me about him was, do you love him? And I said, yes, I do. I, I told you I fell for him. And anyway, um, my dad knew the family, knew that knew her and Edith's dad's sisters, because they were in a little bitty town there in Crane, and so she, he knew about the family, and he knew he was a pretty good guy, or he thought he was. <laughs> he was pretty wild there at first, but um, <laughs> we, uh, after he, and, and I started going to church. I mean, I had always gone to church all my life. I never, I just never stopped, even in high school and college. And we had lived 25 miles out in the country when I was in high school because uh, my dad worked for this oil company and they had a company house. So we lived there. 
And we would ride the school bus 25 miles every morning and then 25 miles back in the evening after school. So, but the last year I was in high school, I had gotten a job at this little uh, drugstore and uh, had a good friend who uh, was mother and dad. She was the only child and, and her, the mother's mother had moved and lived with them and I had built her a little bitty house in the back of their house in Crane. And so the grandmother had gone back to California. And so my friend's parents said, why don't you stay here with us and you won't have to travel like 25 miles back and forth to from the camp. So I had been doing that and I was staying there when I was working after high school. And so um, that's when I, I met Anita's dad and he had noticed me because I had been working in the drugstore and then he started um, set his eyes on me and I, of course, I, he was really a nice young man, good looking. And so I, I fell for him. But when he, um, after we had been dating several months, he said, why don't you go back to college with me and live in so live in Alpine? And I said, well, uh, there's only one thing. <laughs> I won't go back unless we're married. So he said, but let's get married. <laughs> <laughs> when I had known this preacher that uh, preached for the church there in Crane, his name was Eddie Myers. I don't know if any of you know Edwin and Edward Myers. They uh, attended Sunset School of Preaching, and they were both pretty famous back in that time. But their dad had been our preacher in Crane, and so I had known him really well. And so I said, okay, well, all this, uh, he was in Odessa at that time, preaching for our church there. I said, um, I'll get my dad's car, because neither one of us had a car. Oh. And I said, I'll just get my car. Well, my sister had just gotten married three months before that, and they had borrowed dad's car. <laughs> <laughs> and she married a guy from Oklahoma who was already a petroleum engineer and working for an oil company. So I knew we could get the car. <laughs> so we got the car and we went to Odessa and Eddie Myers performed the ceremony. And so um, after that, and all the, I have to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, my sister said, why don't you ask somebody to go with you as your escort? Because they had already asked another young man and his, his uh, uh, girlfriend to go with them as, as, as witnesses to their wedding in Odessa. And so I thought, well, I'm going to ask Gary Mansell because I had known him and and we had um, sort of set our eyes on each other. And so I asked him to go with us. So we did. There were three couples of us in that car. And we drove to Odessa. And they, and they got <clears throat> married by Eddie Myers. And also, they decided that's where they would spend their honeymoon in Odessa, Texas. <laughs> so we all came back to Crane in, in Dad's car. Well, I had to take Barry over to his house, so I took him home because he was living with his mother, and he said, sit down on the porch and talk to me a while. So I did. Well, we talked for an hour, and my sister was really getting upset because she was putting off her honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he just, he just really got interested in me and probably because he knew I hadn't been dated hardly at all out of high school. And so he thought, man, here's another conquest. <laughs> and so uh, we visited a while, but then I just got really interested in him. But um, back to my story about Sadie and Sylvan. Um, 
and our friends. We had lived in Midland for many years and had gone to church together, the four families of us, and gotten really close. And in fact, we're like I said, up until they all passed away, we were all still really close. And so um, after uh, uh, after Sylvan and I started, after he um, began to visit me every weekend, coming from Oklahoma to uh, Abilene, um, he just finally said, why don't we get married? No, he just finally said, why don't you move to, because he had to still had a daughter, 14 years old, Jana. He said, why don't you come and live with us, me and Jana, in Oklahoma? And so I said, well, um, that's kind of uh, what the first, my first husband said. <laughs> but I said, we, we, we have to get married. So um, he just started the process. He they got, got a, I got a ring and I still have it. Um, and and so um, he, we um, about let's see that was in <coughs> August or September and in November the thirteenth, nineteen seventy six was when we got married. <laughs> but I went ahead and sold the house. And got a. Um, I was going to get a, a go get finish my degree that I started in love of, and live my single life in peace and commit, contentment. But that and that was what I was starting to do and thought I would do, but that was not to be. And Sylvan said, after, of course, we married and uh, <clears throat> and I moved to Oklahoma. But he's, he told um, somebody, I can't remember who it was, he said, and he said, after 44 great marriage of, to, me, of, to me, he had, um, that Janine had tricked him into marrying again. <laughs> <laughs> but we were both blessed, and we both acquired more family. After he passed away in 2020, I am still deeply involved with his children and all his family, and along with mine. And so uh, I've been really blessed. He had three children, and uh, there's and one one of them is married. But um, he had a great family. He grown up in Alabama. And always wanted to go back to Alabama. So after when we were married, we I wanted to travel all over the United States, and I did rope him into taking me a lot of places. <laughs> but we mostly would go back to Alabama because that's uh -huh. what he did. He every t summer he and his family would travel to Alabama and spend three two weeks. And that was their vacation. But that was not my idea of a vacation. <laughs> But anyway, um, I'm still involved with his family and uh, have really enjoyed each and every one of them. And uh, <clears throat> his three children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and counting the own that I have and in, in some contact with all of them, just about... <coughs> There are 24 of us in all. So I have 24 great grandchildren. And they are, they are great. And I have uh, 14 grandchildren. And uh, I try to send them all a card on their birthdays. And a few of them come to visit me and want to stay with me occasionally. But I had to put a stop to that because um, when the granddaughter and her husband had had one little boy, and he was five at the time when they came to stay with me for three days. But he, it, it was too cold for him to go outside to play, so he climbed all over my furniture, jumped from <laughs> one sofa to a chair, and just was uh, really active. And it was too cold to go outside, but fortunately. Uh, my granddaughter's sister, Melissa, my other granddaughter, came and she stayed too, and she played with him. 
If she hadn't, well, I would never have gotten to visit with them. <laughs> anyway, I, so I decided that my children can come and stay with me, <laughs> but my grandchildren have to get a hotel. <laughs> 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 and when it comes to me and mother, too, because I lived in Gatesville. The ranch, of course, when we lived out there, they loved to come out there. We had horses and and uh, things to do. Fun had a creek to swim in, and, uh, and so they were used to visiting us and and being with us in the summers. So um, anyway, um, back to Oklahoma. Uh, we, I, I lived there. 10 years. Sylvan had been there in the previous 10, so he lived there 20 years. But after 20 years, he decided to retire from the bank. He was still pretty young, but he decided that he, he just wanted to retire. And he also had kind of had his eye on the ranch, too, because he thought, well, Helen owns this ranch. Why can't we go down there and live? And so, um, of course, I, he had supported me, and I had paid, paid it all paid for it. So, um, and my, parent, um, my son and his wife were living there, but um, they said they would uh, move, uh, they would find their own place to live. So, um, we, and, and of course, we had built, we had moved a trailer house there. We'd go visit and lived in this trailer house on our, on some property that uh, uh that um uh, the 20 acres and was i had split up my property when i made moved to love between anita and i and my son and left him with his 20 acres there anyway um i still own the property so i went ahead and deeded my husband nine acres so we would have our own uh, park to live on and we had bought a trailer house and lived there and it. But then while we were living there in that trailer, he built, he and his, and he and my son, with his son's help too, built our house. So they built a small house for us and we added on to it later. And so we had a place to live. And so, um, and my son and his wife just lived right up the road. So we moved there to Gatesville and lived there until Sylvan's health declined and we moved into town for two years. But his health continued to decline and he finally lost his battle with uh, heart trouble in um, the year 2020. But in the year 1996, I began, no, it was about 1998, I began to get involved in prison ministry because we lived in Gatesville. It's home to five women's prisons, all the state prisons for women except one is located in Gatesville. And while we were in the church there, I asked if people from the church we're going into the prisons, and they said at that time, no, they won't let us in. Well, they didn't realize that there were some people, some volunteers, some women and some men coming, oh, and there was a men, one men's unit. There's five women's prisons and one men's. And there were some women from Fort Worth area in the church who were coming down and volunteering in one of the prisons. And they, they saw that the church was not involved at that time in prison ministry. So they asked, they came to the church and spoke and asked if we had any volunteers that wanted to go into the prisons and take, really kind of take their place because they were traveling every week from Fort Worth to visit. And so uh, I heard about it and I thought, well, why not? I mean, how could I not go into the prison? because I, I was free, I wasn't working, and I, I could go and volunteer. And at that time, the churches could send people in, send individuals in 
and they get to teach and um, have men preach also. But uh, that's not the case anymore, of course. They stopped that a long time ago. Well, they stopped it within uh, a few years after I started. So I got involved, and another lady and I started going in, and we taught. On Wednesday night, that's when they had their Bible study. Only time we could go in, we we went for years, oh, maybe 10 years into that one women's unit to teach the Bible. And then we also had opportunity to go into the, all the other units. And there's a main, one of the main units there now is Mountain View. It was one of the older units. But um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my prison ministry. But first, I want to read a little bit about a guy that I knew that was uh, from the Corpus Christi uh, area, and he had been involved in the New Life Behavior Ministry, which is a prison ministry formed in uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. And that was the part, it's called the New Life Behavior Ministry. Although the guy that created it lives in Dallas, but also one of the main couples that were involved lived in Corpus. But anyway, I want to read a little bit about what um, he said about his life and his part in the prison ministry. He said, God doesn't make junk. Junk is made by man. He says his name was Pinky Bates, and he, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He says, if you are where I was a few years ago, your self-worth is below the floor, but don't give up. You still awaken to the fact that God made you and loves all that he creates. God saw everything he had made, and it was very good, Genesis 1.31. And he says, hi, my, my friends, my name is Pinky. Yes, that is my real name. He's kind of like a boy named Sue. <laughs> this face beat up a lot of fists. I grew up fighting. My life was as Johnny Cash saying, in the mud and the blood and the beer. I clearly recall fights over my name as early as in the first grade. However, by God's grace, coupled with loving Christian friends and a willingness to let God keep working on me, I longer, no longer fight over my name. My name is really easy to remember. Pinky is just a servant of God, and my battle for respect is over. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13 My alcoholic, drug addict, as an ex-offender, with 38 years of insanity, pain and shame is under the bridge. In 1977, I was serving time in the Walls Unit in Huntsville, Texas, where Buck Griffith came to see me. Buck was my only visitor. I'll never forget his words. Don't give up. God can still use you. Many years have passed, like Job, I had heard the Lord before, but I sure do see him now, Job 42 and 5. He walks with me today. He talks with me. He gives direction to my feet, my heart, and my mind. God made me in his image. No, God doesn't make junk, but man has the ability to take the finest jewelry and trash it. There was a time when I felt useless. My drugging and drinking got me shot, stabbed, and lots of broken bones. Vehicles ran over me three times. I've been in a body cast from my armpits to my ankles. I suffered a broken nose, jaw, legs, arms, ribs, and hands. My insane lifestyle destroyed three marriages, two profitable businesses, and plenty of good jobs. I've been arrested over 30 times that I recall. <laughs> and, and I spent lots of birthdays and holidays locked up. I spent time in a French prison and one in Mexico. 
I once escaped from the military stockade in France only to realize I'd made a big mistake. I didn't speak the language, was flat broke, barefooted, <clears throat> and hungry, exhausted. I was free, quotes, but trapped. As usual, I had jumped from the frying pan into the skillet. So I rushed back to the prison and asked if I could be readmitted. <laughs> The words, both, the words God spoke to me in prison stuck in my head. Don't give up. God still can use you. How could my sorry past be useful to anyone? Our Lord said, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. By God's amazing grace, I was blessed in 1992 to go back to the same prison where I did time. But as a servant of Christ, this time instead of a lawbreaker. <laughs> Today, I constantly praise Him for bringing my soul out of prison. That's Psalm 142, verse 7. I know that with God, I have endless hope. Without Him, I had a hopeless end. Philippians 3, 13, 14 advises us to put the past behind us, reach ahead, and press toward the prize. Before my spiritual awakening, it was easier to cop out, blame some person, something, or circumstance. I used to blame my insanity on my parents. My mom died from years of abusing prescription drugs, and dad died an alcoholic. A hopeless end. By the standard of this world, I was a lost cause. Except for God and but everyone else had given up on forget had given up on me. I had given up on myself. I pondered the words of 724. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let God have his way in your life. As hard as it is to believe, he loves you. Take one day at a time and let him direct your path. You can't face anything greater than you can bear because the Lord is in control and help you escape. And those of us in prison and alcoholics drug are always standing, what, scheming ways to escape. Of course, these are things that he said when he was back ministering in, in the prison. He said, I was tired of emptying trash cans one day and said I could do a lot more. But this was to Buck Griffith. If you can't handle a little job, you can't handle a big one. And Jeremy quoted Jeremiah 12 and 5. It says, if you race with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage the thickets? The key is don't quit. Ecclesiastes 9.4 says, anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. The living know they will die, but the dead know nothing. You may feel like a dog, but if it's alive, get up, help from above, shake off the fleas and do better. <laughs> and of course, Pinky Joe Bates won victory on June 19th, 2003. His long struggle is over. And he's resting in the arms of Jesus. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of the people I worked with. Uh, there, I mean, Pinky came and visited us there in Gatesville prisons, and um, I knew him. He was he was a great person, great great um, active in prison ministry. Okay. Anyway, let me read you just a tiny bit about my prison ministry. It was back in um, the uh, 19s and 1800s, it was a Texas Boys, Boys Reformatory or state school. Buildings were built and remodeled to house male juveniles until the 1970s when it came to Mountain View and Hilltop and became female offenders. And um, like I said, I wonder why people weren't going into the prison because at that time we could. And so I volunteered and started doing that. And I did that for 25 years. And it woke me up to some mistakes in my life. I have 
I had been a Christian all my life, just about, and thought I was um, uh, doing good. I was a law keeper. I thought I obeyed all the rules. You know, I was I was in a good shape. But when I started to prison, I saw women in there who were Christians, and they didn't have the opportunity that I had had, and they were living the Christian life. And then one of them was. Um, a girl from India, and I, I just wish I could stand here and talk to you about her all the time. Her name is Aruna Kavali. She was a Hindu when she came to the United States. Her husband, her arranged marriage husband, brought her here, and she then had three children, one little boy, but the little boy passed away accidentally. But since she was a Hindu, spoke no English, and uh, didn't, couldn't defend herself, her husband let her take the blame because he thought he would might get the blame and he'd be sent to prison. Well, sure enough, she's got a life sentence because if you kill a child, if you're involved in the life of uh, the death of a child, you get an automatic four-year sentence. So she's still there. She is was converted in prison by another volunteer, another prisoner, and uh, she says she's glad she came to prison because she uh, learned to speak English. She learned the gospel. And she um, is still a friend of mine. And she's the only one I ever, only prisoner I ever allowed to call me of all the ones I knew. She's the only one I ever allowed to call me. Black. And she still calls me some. And I still, and I visited her when I lived in Gatesville, but she is a wonderful example of Christianity and how God can use us if we let him. And that's not my story so far. <laughs>